one thing about the Berkebeiner is that it attracts racers from virtually everywhere. And, you know, I mean, like as many as 40 states and a dozen foreign countries. In fact, it is the biggest ski event in North America. Berkebeiner is very much like the Citizens Olympics. It's an Olympics uh, for, for anyone. It's an event that can, you know, put them at that pinnacle of uh, success. Berkey is unlike any other race in that it is, it's, Berkebeiner is an event. And you, it's just a special feeling about this race. You look, I stood in the end of the second line in the start, and I look back, and there are literally thousands of people behind me. And often when I shoot the can, and all I can hear is keep fire climbing. And people whooping and yelling. And a lot of the races I've been to now, you've got real good skiers, great skiers. But you don't have the, you don't have the duffers. To finish the Berkebeiner for them, it is, it's a, just a major accomplishment. I, I, I know when I start, when I sample line, I'm going to finish the Berkebeiner. Okay, I know that I'm probably going to make the 25% club unless I do something, some incredible, foolish folly. But a lot of people are out there, and it is, a, you know, they don't know that they can finish it. The Berkebeiner is listed as 55 kilometers, which translates to 34 miles, and any way you measure it, kilometers, miles, it's, it's a long way to ski in a day. Cross-country skiing, as far as equipment goes and, and getting set up, is, is really a simple sport. you got your boot, which fits into a binding, which is as simple as you can get. I think there's you know, basically one moving part in the binding. You put the toe in the binding, clamp it down, you, you grab your poles, and you're all set to go, really. You don't have to, don't have to go in any special area. If you've got snow, you can ski, really. The, the move on my part to competitive skiing is, I guess, totally um, uh, not in keeping with anything I've done in the past, strictly because I've never been a competitive person, never participated in, in high school athletics or any other type of thing. About well, it would be four years ago this winter, I decided to, to enter a few citizens' races, just, just out of curiosity, because I did enjoy the, the uh, skiing on a track and skiing fast. Find my, found myself doing uh, well and then found myself enjoying them and just made gradually made the commitment more and more to competitive skiing and strictly to cross-country skiing. The roller skis, I think, uh, from, from the point of a cross-country skier, have been the best thing to come along in, in years because they allow you to be very, very specific in the muscles you use. Running is a nice exercise because it works your, your heart and your lungs biking for the same reason, but they don't exercise the specific muscles you need for cross-country skiing. That's where roller skiing has, has been, been such a dramatic improvement for, for the cross-country skier in the past couple of years. They allow you to practice the diagonal stride, the double pulling, uh, double pulling with kick, uh, just everything you want to do on snow, and they, they at the same time are working the specific muscles, which is very important. That's what it all comes down to. I think one of the, the real ironies about cross-country skiing, at least as it, as it strikes me, is that you spend so much of your time training for, for the racing season, doing things other than skiing. You, you spend all summer running, you're biking, you're roller skiing, and as close as, as I can be, especially the roller skiing, it's not, you're not skiing, you're doing something else. A friend of mine says in July, he says, darn, I wish, wish we could snow tomorrow. And I think that's in the back of every skier's mind. You want to get on the snow where you can get really the training that's what you got to get because that's what it comes down to is skiing on snow so we'll start skiing in november normally around here and you know it's, it's just so exciting the first few times you get out and you're smooth and it's it's really brisk and refreshing and it's really good then you start the racing season uh, probably in december and you start with the, with the smaller races around here the shorter distance ones the 15 kilometers maybe a few 30 kilometers but all, all the time, you know, that you know, February is going to come in the Berkebeiner. The third week in February, you're going to be racing the Berkey. It's always out there. The, and the races you're racing are important. But the Berkebeiner, I think that's, that's the big one. That's, that's the most important one. It's the last race in the season. That's the one you remember. We graduated from Princeton in engineering and Harvard Business School. Uh, masters of uh, business administration. Then I went to work for the Heil Company and was married and uh, I've worked for Heil ever since. Well, I was uh, uh, inveigled into going to the Cartelop at the, the halfway race last year. Some friends said it was fun and I, I decided to, to try it and it was fun. It was a 
great experience. And at the end of the race, uh, my friend said, let's next year do the Berkebiner. And I said, yes. The uh, team uh, that uh, I'm trying to train with in Milwaukee has only had one meeting so far. And we hope uh, the next two weekends to get out on the hills and, because the ski race is just three weeks away. Pete Picado is a member of the Holy Hill Ski Club. Uh, I'm a member. I met him last year. He's sort of taken me under his wing to try and train me for this race with his group. Uh, he's even given me a special ski cap that I'll be wearing in the race. Psychologically, he's been very encouraging. Uh, I wish I'd had more time to learn a better technique from him. Um, what I want to do is go faster with the same amount of effort. Basically, it's a long-range goal to train for, and I need something like that in order to get up every morning and do my exercise. Exercise just for its own sake is, to me, a little boring. But if I have an objective, and a training objective, um, it, it uh, motivates me a little bit. I do feel nervous when I think about the race, because it's a long distance. I, I'm not sure how I will react. And uh, uh, there is a certain element of hazard that uh, you can fall on some of the uh, steep spots and get rammed from the back. Uh, but I, I look forward to it very much. Last fall, after, after uh, running for about a year and a half, I decided that I'd like, I maybe would like to try to ski the Berkebiner. Well, I've been cross-country skiing for about the past six years. Uh, just decided one year to start skiing and have been a recreational skier for about six years. Uh, really nothing more than, than going out and, and uh, plodding along some trails, just enjoying the countryside in the winter. Uh, I decided that with a certain amount of training, the same way in my running, I could build up my ability and my conditioning, I could probably ski the Berkebiner. Of course, we've had a very bad winter. There's been very little snow. I had hoped to train for at least three months for the race. I haven't had much chance to train. There hasn't been much snow in Madison. I've ski done some skiing on golf courses. I decided to take some time and go up to Telemark. I found out that I was severely lacking in a lot of training and felt uh, that really to do the total Berkebiner would be something that would really exhaust me. So upon returning to Madison, I decided that with a with uh, short amount of training I had done, I really shouldn't try for the Berkebiner, that I should go ahead and try for the Cordelopet. Preparing for the race, uh, I think the most important thing for me to do is to pace myself. People will be going past me at a much faster pace, and I have a feeling that will encourage me to go probably faster than I should although I'll, I'll concentrate on pacing myself. Hello. There's some catalytic thing happening in these mass races, just like the uh, Sioux Sundance. I guess every year you have to have a gathering of the clan to get your soul uh, exhilarated for the next year. And when all these cuts on these skiers come, you can feel it already here. You can feel the Swedes came in late. Uh, there's just a kind of uh, gathering the clan feeling here, and that regenerates you and recharges you for the next year. Lifestyle of this country has changed considerably. They want to be that active sports, lifetime sports. We oh, yeah. hope a telemark will provide that for them. This was some kind of a challenge there to put this back, this area back into its heyday of economic stability. And it was always my desire to come back and figure some way out to upgrade the economic situation here. The influx of people that come through here that are cross-country skiers in comparison or relation to what used to be downhill skier is just uh, staggering, really. Uh, I'm going to estimate perhaps in excess of a million dollars will uh, flow into our area. Your professionals are all bust in, they're all brought in, but everybody else is, brings their own car and some of them sleep outside, some of them sleep under their cars, in their cars, 
and any place else they can find. When you start thinking about 6,000 people are coming into an area, everybody benefits and everybody and everybody gets their blood boiling a little bit to see all these people, foreigners coming in. They were from about seven fellows from Germany, and our strangest experience with them, we had to warm their beer up. You know, and they, they're all so pleasant, and they enjoy talking to us. We began in 1973. At that time, there were somewhere around 68 or 69 skiers in the first race. There were 53 finishers, and from there it grew by, by leaps and bounds. Race week is when everything really starts to come together. Basically, that's what you want. You want a perfect track. We have racers in the American Berkebiner from around 15 foreign nations. Many of these racers are simply what we call the citizen skiers. The skiers like the everyday doctor, dentist, factory worker, just the everyday skier. But there is a certain breed of skier which we call the elite racers. But the elite racers come from far and wide. They range from Austria to Norway, to Sweden, to Finland, to Switzerland, to Germany, to Italy, to France. And these racers are a, a breed in themselves. They're the group of 15, 20, 50, or 100 skiers that take off from in front of the pack and before the racers are even out to the two or three kilometer point, this group of elite racers is already far ahead of the pack. This year was a clean start. Came off the other side and had good glide, came down the hill in good shape. I spotted people ahead of me. I didn't, I'm not a good fast mass start man. I was when the gun goes, I'm not up there with the leaders right off the bat. So I came down, I picked out guys ahead of me that I knew that I'd skied with this year on that great they're ahead of me, I'll, you know, I'll pace off them. And again, I could see these guys in front of me that I wanted to ski with, I knew I could ski with them, ski with them all year. And so I wanted to keep in contact with them.
their track set up here to go straight out and was in pretty good shape. I kept them there out there for the first seven kilometers, the first, about the first seven kilometers out on the power line. And you got some good uphills and, and some nice uh, straight out downhills. And I was skiing well, downhills has a good glide. And I saw myself catching people there and I had good contact. I knew I was going to you know, keep in contact, keep in touch with these guys in front of me that I wanted to be with. Now, one thing that is, has come about in the Berka Biner with the numbers of elite skiers that are now competing in the race is that the skiers are, are racing in packs. The one real key, especially in the Berka Biner, is to maintain contact or stay close to the skier ahead of you on the uphill. The Berka Biner is probably about two-thirds uphill and one-third downhill, which means that for the champions that are going to be going out there and finishing in three hours, they're going to be spending two hours on an uphill battle against their competitor. And if they lose time on the uphill, there is not enough downhill time left for them to make up that, uh, that difference later in the race. I skied through the first speed station at 7K, grabbed a drink there, and went thundering down the road there. At 10K, there's a, there's a sneaky downhill. You go down, cut your left, real sharp left corner. I knew it was there and fell anyhow. Had a good line going into the corner, good speed coming through. Just, just, I don't know what happened. I knew, you know, I knew it was there, I knew what I had to do to get through it, and didn't, didn't do it, fell. At that point, lost contact, lost touch with the, the group ahead of me that I wanted to get, wanted to stay with. That was, I think, looking back, an important juncture in the race, because I had lost touch with the guys, and I was never to pick up again. With it. And my, my strategy basically was to be steady for the first 25, first 27 and a half case through the halfway point then try to pick people off. It was a good strategy, did basically what I wanted to do, except by 25K the wax is done. If you're looking at a skier from, from a viewpoint of just straight technique, you're considering, I think, really three probably basic stances, three basic strides, a diagonal stride, which is just the most familiar to everybody with it. Legs and the arms are working in unison. You're, you'll see that on the flats or uphills. Uh, the double pull, which uh, in which the skis are held just flat on the snow, and, and the skier is pushing himself forward by extending forward with his arms, planting the poles, and then compressing over the poles. Uh, and then the, the uh, double pull with a stride, in which uh, you, you combine the two of them. Really. You combine a, a kick with a, a both arms out there in a double pull. And you'll see that on the flats and the downhills up a little bit hill. Of course, when you're coming downhill, you're in a tuck, and it's a pretty much a static position. You're just in a tuck, and you're holding it. There's a lot going on and within that, you know, a lot of little balances and stuff like that you have to be aware of. But for all intents and purposes, you aren't doing a heck of a lot when you're in a downhill tuck. factor about uh, long distance cross country skiing as compared to long distance foot racing for example is that you can't hold back and expect that in the last three or four miles of the race you're going to be able to get a strong kick and go on and beat the competitor because you are limited with mechanical aspects of just how fast your skis can go against the snow. I think a good example of how what cross country skiing is like especially coming into that finish area is the year that Per Knoten won the race with Art Harstead, uh, who had won the previous year, finishing second. You can notice as they come across Lake Hayward that the distance between the two, despite all the efforts they could possibly muscle, did not change a bit. They didn't change one inch. I had Art Hosta, last year's winner, on my ski, all the time. Then we got in the flat land, 
he was still on my team. And then I went on the other track, trying to get him in front to, to get uh, some uh, sprint. But he wouldn't. And then I tried harder, and then he was behind. Five seconds in finish. After 55 kilometers of uh, extreme strain, they uh, do some extra push as the finish, and we uh, congratulate and cheer them all on. And here is coming the third. Who is that? He has done 55 kilometers in this race. It's number 562, Jan Bjorkheim of Norway, who is uh, leading the event at the 35-kilometer mark. Please uh, cheer on Jan Bjorkheim of Norway. Our third Coming in, uh, number 16 is Mati Kusko of Sweden. Uh -huh. well, at a certain point late in the race, I realized that because of the wax problems I was having, I wasn't going to place very well in the race, and I wasn't going to be as competitive as I wanted to be. At that point, the pressure's off. 25th, uh, didn't do well. And I finished the race thinking, damn it, I, I want to come back. i got to do better next year. The trail sort of uh, wove around in a snake-like fashion for a while. So you could see thousands of people up in front of you uh, going around corners and heading down the trail. It was, it was really a sight to behold. The first food station was around eight kilometers, and I, I felt pretty good. I decided not to stop, uh, which probably was a mistake. Uh, by the time the next station came along, I was very thirsty. I remember approaching uh, the worst tail, which was which was uh, posted with a sign, "Caution, Steve Hill." Well, my heart just sunk when I saw that. I... And there were, at that point, I think about six lanes of uh, tracks, and people were backed up, and six people would go down at a time. Uh -oh. Usually, about half of them fell. I uh, fell on that hill, and I remember falling and looking up the hill to see if anyone was coming down right behind me. I wanted to get out of the way. I barely got my skis out of the way uh, of someone else who was right behind me and uh, managed to pull myself together and get out of the way and continue on down the track. Throughout the history of the Berkebiner, there's been literally thousands and thousands of fascinating people that have come across the finish line. One of them is uh, a 40-year-old gentleman from San Francisco by the name of Harry Cordellis. It took Harry two years to realize his goal, and that was to complete the American Berkebiner. And it's something that uh, a, a lot of skiers may take for granted, but Harry's blind. My goal this year is to finish it. If I have to come in on my hands and knees, I'm going to finish it. I have a sighted guide, and he'll call out, a slight turn to the left, a dip, a bump, dig in for an uphill, glide it out going downhill. I saw a lot of very interesting people in a lot of very interesting outfits. The finish line was, uh, it was good to see. It was, I felt good. I felt a little bit disappointed that that the race was over, although I did feel that I just wouldn't have had enough energy to, to ski another 27 and a half kilometers. And as I remember, there was a, a girl right at the halfway point who stood out on the... Uh, on the trail and she'd slap each of us as we go by and say, good work, now you're halfway. Uh, the first half went surprisingly easily for me. I did get confused. Uh, you, you count the kilometers as you go and I expected I was going to be at 38 and suddenly saw I was only at 36. Boy, that discouraged me. Oranges, warm water. Cold beer, we got it all. Cold beer. All right. Oranges. I would stop and pick up the uh, 
Gatorade, and I tried to drink two cups of Gatorade at each stop, but I didn't. I didn't stay long. And my theory is just keep going. I I was afraid if I'd stop and rest, I'd find it hard to get started again. After the halfway point or the 17-mile point of the American Berkebiner, it becomes uh, absolutely essential for racers to really monitor their own uh, physiological uh, condition uh, throughout that uh, last 17 miles. One of the key problems that racers have and that uh, the first aid people on the staff look for is the problem of hypothermia. Basically what hypothermia is is the lowering of the core body temperature. And this can come from a, a number of factors. Uh, one is dehydration, another might be the cooling effects of sweating, and, or possibly just plain running out of energy. And a, a, a common syndrome in the Berkebiner is what racers uh, refer to as hitting the wall, which usually occurs sometime maybe in the last 10 miles of the race, when racers just simply can't go anymore. muscular coordination when they get down towards the latter part of the race. And this is a symptom that may very well be brought on by things like hypothermia. They'll either collapse or just physically are, are unable uh, to move adequately anymore. in the American Berkebiner in the Cordillo, but every skier who crosses the finish line receives a medallion. We feel this is extremely important because whether you finish first in the race or whether you finish down in the 4,000th position, if you finish that race, you are indeed a champion and deserve to be honored just as well as the first skier across that line. My feeling was uh, one of great pleasure to have finished. Uh, I was... I felt I could have gone a little further if I'd had to, and uh, I figured that I wanted to do better next year. I would have a chance to win. Well, I did it, and perhaps I could have failed. But uh, today it was my day. Partial funding for this program was provided by the Central Educational Network.